Hey everyone, it's Norm here from I Am Cars. Welcome back to our YouTube channel and welcome to our first podcast. So we are going to be doing some podcasts here. Uh, just a little bit of behind the scenes on different things here at the dealership with some interesting guests. And this is someone maybe a little bit familiar to the channel. has been in a couple videos. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us your role here at the dealership. Well, my name is David Baker, <laughs> and um, I'm the CEO. CEO of the... Of the car dealership. Of the car dealership. And an occasional guest of the YouTube channel. Oh, and an occasional guest of the YouTube yes. channel. When I'm invited, I, uh, I put my two bits in uh, uh, on occasion, and um, not often... Just and I've been I've right. been wanting you to do a podcast for a while, and I wanted you to be the first guest. Thank you. And here we are. So um, I guess originally, what got you started in the auto industry? Well, that goes back a long time ago. <laughs> um, it goes back to 1972 in the United Kingdom. Um, at that time, uh, uh, very young man, I. I I, I, when I left school, I was being trained as a, an accountant, and that anybody that's involved in that end of uh, business um, knows that uh, accounting is quite boring. It's, uh, it's it's a good job. It's challenging, but it's boring. And uh, in those days, um, you know, newspaper was where you would read ads for employment opportunities and. And, I, and um, I worked for a company, I got hired by a company by the name of Henleys, uh, spelled H-E-N-L-Y-S. Uh, they were probably the largest British Leyland dealer in the United Kingdom. And, um, the, you know, they were heavily involved in Jaguar, uh, Daimler a product, which was part of the British Leyland group at that time. And um, Henleys, it wasn't a case of, you know, being thrown out on, on the showroom floor. They actually trained me. I went to a, a, a school or a, um, I won't say it was a school, a university type thing um, in Scotland. A place called, um, I was going to say Gordonstown, but that, well, that wasn't Gordonstown. But anyway, they trained me properly. I went to the school and then they trained me uh, uh, in the in the business of selling cars. And that's what I, that's how I started. Excellent, very detailed. So if we were to fast forward to today, what are a couple of the positive things about the auto industry today for someone who is either involved in it or looking to get involved in it? I think um, one's got to remember that uh, probably the biggest positive side of the auto industry and is that it probably employs in let's take Alberta for example probably employs indirectly or directly 35% of the population so that's probably the biggest so it is a big industry it's a big industry yes. yeah. so uh, on the contrary what are some of the negative things you can say about the auto industry today legislation and do you want to touch on that you know, I, I really don't, but if you, if you look at the legislation that involves itself uh, with the industry, right from the, you know, big governments uh, dictating to the manufacturers um, how many miles per gallon their vehicles have to do, you know, collectively, and of course the manufacturers cheat on that. Uh, yeah. They'll actually produce a car <laughs> with a three-cylinder engine, not sell any, yeah. but then it managed to bring their averages down. Yeah. But legislation is, is quite heavy, a heavy burden on the industry. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you go from the governments to the manufacturers, and you can go from jurisdictions like Alberta, which has, uh, um, you know, the infamous uh, Hamvik, and, you know, that's to try and level the playing field, but then again, it's it's another burden on the dealers. Yeah, 
there is lots of different legislation at all different levels, like right. said, from manufacturer all the way down to to consumer at the very end. So I, I know that. So over the course of your, uh, I guess, 50 years in the auto industry, what are some of the major changes that you have seen? Well, the industry is a moving target. Yeah. And I've said that for many years, and it is a moving target. Uh, manufacturers come, manufacturers go. Um, obviously, you know, the, uh, the industry and the improvement upon cars is definitely there. Um, nobody makes a car, I don't believe, with a carburetor anymore. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they went to uh, direct uh, fuel injection. And, um, you know, you ask a technician, and we had a car recently, uh, which had a carburetor, if you recall, and nobody knew how to start it in the shop. 1975 except... Corvette, we and, got it going. And who got it started for the test? Yep. That is, in, that is in one of our YouTube videos, <laughs> a detailed process of how we started that yeah. car. And that's it, the techs haven't got a clue on that uh, particular system. So, you know, you, the technological advances are definitely there. Uh, the, you know, the biggest change is that uh, towards electrification of cars and EVs, as they're now being uh, described. And the manufacturers are having to do it, and we all know why. Um, are the electric cars better? We'll see. We'll see down the road. They have but their positive the and negatives. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And that kind of touches on my next question. So what further changes do you see in the coming future to the auto industry? Obviously, electric's a big one. That's the way everything's going. Um, well, I, I read a lot of the uh, industry magazines and the automotive news that comes out of Detroit once a week. Um, you know, EVs uh, is on, heavily on the manufacturer's mind. Um, I think the way people finance vehicles yeah. or fund their purchase, I think there's going to be a shift there. I mean, we're already starting to see... Uh, you know, finance contracts on new cars go into 108 months. Um, that's a long time. Yeah. Um, is there a better way of uh, ownership of a vehicle? There has to be. Um, maybe it will be ride sharing of, of a type. So I think that that's going to develop. Yeah. So do you think it's going to become easier for consumers to purchase or obtain vehicles as time goes on, or harder? Well, some of the dictation uh, of whether somebody can afford a car, uh, you know, it has to be to do with uh, their income level. Uh, the price of cars do not seem to be going down, and right now, um, you know, used vehicles, for example, are commanding a price that is way beyond that of uh, new car prices. The best deal on the, in the car these days is a new, a new car. car. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, uh, you know, that's as long as you're selling and buying from a dealer that only wants MSRP. Yeah. And some of the dealers are managing to get more than MSRP yeah. by methods. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the financing of a vehicle, funding of a vehicle for a customer has got to be a challenge. So shifting, shifting uh, focus to something like this business, what are some of the challenges of owning a business like this one today? You're referring to an automobile sales um, business? As, yeah, a small car dealership, let's say, in Canada. Well, the biggest, or business in general like this one. The, the biggest challenge uh, today for an automobile dealer uh, is inventory and the supply of inventory. Uh, and certainly, I've always been a, a believer that you, you, know, you make money not when you sell the car, it's when you buy the car. And what you've got right now is this imbalance where used vehicles are selling thousands of dollars over um, you know, new car price, or yeah. as it was two or three years ago, you get, you know, Five to ten thousand more than it yeah. costs brand new, or or in some cases, a hundred thousand over. Yeah, like that car behind us. It's 
it is ridiculous in that. Um, so that is a that is a big challenge for anybody getting into this business because you make your money when you buy it, not when you sell it. Yes. And when the market corrects, which it will. Yes. And it's probably already started. Yep. When that market corrects, some dealers are not going to make any money. Yep. What about um, people, staff? Well, this is going back to what the biggest challenge is yep. again. Okay, so inventory is definitely yep. a, a big challenge. Staff is definitely key to a lot of uh, businesses, not only the auto industry. Where have all the workers gone? And uh, rec we've been advertising here, as you know, uh, for several months for an additional technician and never had a response or barely a response and certainly not a response for somebody that was trained properly and uh, that we wanted to hire. I took it upon myself to put an ad in the Ukrainian church in Northeast Calgary thinking that there might just be a Ukrainian uh, that would be uh, uh, available. And we got a technician out of that. And um, our new technician is great. Yeah, very good. But yeah, staff is a big challenge. Um, to, add, to add on to what you were saying, staff is a big challenge. Like, we're advertising at crazy rates of uh, hourly wage and like you either get no replies or you get absolute bums like absolute bums um so over the years here at this dealership do you have any memorable stories <laughs> well you know or I'm, is there too many memorable stories i think there's a lot of memorable yeah. stories uh, uh we're in the 18th year uh, on this, uh, in this location, um, the, there's been many uh, memorable stories. I think probably the thing that stands out most um, for both its entertainment value and what we can't forget uh, is when we did the expansion on the building. Um, in some respects, it was a gong show. Um, we, you know, we, we took the building from 8,000 square feet to 16,000 square feet and we had a building while we were still working at one end of the building and the other end of the building. It's very hectic. And it was, that was a challenge and it, every day was a challenge. Yeah. Um, you know, when you architects come in and they say, well, you did that wrong, um, their employ their uh, con the contractors, uh, they they never seem to be able to come to work and stay the entire day, um, and it was it was pretty well a gong show. I don't think I would ever want to do that again. Yeah, building is a mess. Yeah. Uh, an interesting answer to uh, my question because I wasn't expecting that answer, so I would just take a moment to remind you this office was actually supposed to be a step down this was supposed to be a like a bat cave office and uh one of the project managers messed that one up so yes told you uh, i'd remind you every six months so <laughs> like six months yeah this 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 um yeah the floor was supposed to be about uh, supposed to be a cool like drop down bat cave concept yeah. but that never happened so no but uh, we kind of made amends and we put some lights on the floor and we actually raised up the office floor next door. So it, it, we kind of balanced it out a little bit. So over the years here at International Water Cars, what is one or some of your favorite cars we've had here? I knew that question was going to come up and I really have been given a lot of thought to that one uh, as I said we've been here 18 years there's been a lot of cars go through here um, the first uh, 10 years uh, when we had the Suzuki uh, franchise um, we didn't have a lot of cool cars as you would say uh, most of our it's pretty boring it's pretty was boring, boring. Yeah, I mean, boring it was all Suzuki or Hyundai accents or yeah. things like that 
but as we developed uh, and uh, changed our business model, that's when the more exotic and fancy cars, uh, and we've had a lot of those through here. Have I got a favorite? Have I got a more memorable one? Ferrari Testarossa. Definitely a beautiful car. It was uh, white with a beige interior. Um, and I wish we had the car today. I was just going to say, <laughs> I wish we still had the car today, both for the uh, financial aspect and just the cool factor of that yeah. car. And, you know, I'm, I'm, we sold the car to a CEO of a national company. And um, we hand-delivered. The, some of the tools, because Tool yeah. um, we were going out to Toronto, uh, we had the car shipped for him, and then we didn't want the tools to go missing, uh, so we actually hand delivered them, and he couldn't take them back, he did fly out here yeah. because of the tools in his hand baggage, in his hand baggage. so um, it was very, that was a very interesting car, nice car to drive, it definitely had a lot of uh, I appeal for an old car um, and you know people that would remember Miami Vice it, it was yeah, a replica it of, was a replica white white yeah, tester and, was, and it came from Miami so I mean yeah. <laughs> originally um, but we've had a lot of cars in here and I mean what did I like I that one stands out the most to me um, we've had a lot of other cars from a slant nose uh, Porsche, uh, is that the 930 model? Yep. Yeah, 930 Turbo. Um, you know, that was one of 188 that was built in the world, and it was an actual original slant nose. Um, again, wishing we had that one. Yep. We sold that car and shipped it to uh, Bahrain, yep. to a banker. Um, some very, very nice cars in there. So this would be a perfect transition. What's one of the worst cars we've had in here? Now, I don't know <laughs> what you mean by the word worst. When I say worst, like cars we should have never had. <laughs> I think the most detested vehicle uh, that was in our inventory over the years was a BMW, and I believe it was a 335 <laughs> convertible, hardtop <laughs> convertible. Uh, we probably had the car in our inventory for about five years. Yep. Um, every time we looked at the car, it would break. Yep. Um, and in fact, during the winter months, uh, we had it sat in the back corner of the, of the yard and we just didn't bother moving yeah, it. It, we, it, it got, disappeared in the it snow. It got buried in snow. When I say buried, like we did not see the car was there. Yeah, it was the whole, while buried. there was, yeah. We, yeah, we just pushed the snow over it. Yeah. That was probably the worst. Yeah. And that, I'll just touch on that, you know, so people know, although dealers, we are in the business of making money and we sell cars. And yes, sometimes we make very good money on a car. It goes the other way. That car, we probably lost $25,000 on selling. Just had it for so long. Literally every month, it was like $1,000, $2,000, $4,000. It was never ending um, in addition to just having the car forever. So on the contrary, it's not all profits. There is some losses, and sometimes they are big. Um, so just wanted to touch on that. But yes, the 335. I was expecting a different answer on that. I was expecting a Rolls Royce Phantom, <laughs> but uh, maybe we'll save that one for uh, another another episode. So, just shifting the focus out of um, this business and into let's just say something like the markets right now. Um, obviously, this is an interesting time for people who have money to invest because they're able to capitalize on that. But if you're giving advice to somebody who had ten thousand dollars to invest that's it that's all that that's all the money they have free to invest what would you tell them to do with that ten thousand dollars obviously the, the you know a person's tolerance uh, uh, can they afford to lose the money that has to be part of the answer but if a person's got ten thousand dollars which i don't want to be 
I don't want to be funny with this, but that's not a lot of money these it's, days. It's not a lot of money. That's the reality. Um, so if a person had $10,000 and they wanted to invest it today, since the interest rates are shifting upwards, I just say lock it in on a GIC. Um, not forever, but lock it in for six months. You might get close to 4% on that money, but it's guaranteed. Yeah. At the end of six months, you're going to get 4% extra yeah. based on a, you know, on, yeah. on, a, on a per annum basis. So that's what I would, yeah. you know. And that's, that's the reality. If you have 10000 to invest, realistically, you don't want to lose that money. So it's not like, you know, obviously there's higher returns out there, but I would agree you likely don't want to lose that 10000 because you've likely worked way harder to earn that 10000 than somebody with more money, right? Um, so shifting the question, if you had somebody, same question, but somebody with a million dollars, what would you tell them to invest that million dollars in today? Well, once again, you know, I mean, the tolerance level has to be part of the answer. Yeah. Is the person tolerant enough to be... You know, are they able to lose some of that? Well, likely, let's assume that they're going to be a little bit more on the risky side because they have a little bit more money, right? Mm -hmm. Again, there's a little bit more uh, digging to find out, you know, what, with somebody with a million dollars to invest, are you, do you want to invest that and, you know, get a, an income on a monthly basis? Or do you just want to bail out after a year? Or can you, you know, lock that money up for five years? I would suggest commercial real estate. Yep. Very good uh, option. Can you touch on that more? Just an idea of why they would buy that and what benefits they would have from real, it? Yeah, real estate generally um, is something that you don't really lose on. Um, unless you've made a bad decision during the buying process and overpaid. Overpaid. But generally, if you sit on a piece of land or a building for um, a number of years, it will, even if it drops a little bit, it will recover. Yep. Uh, real estate does that. Um, so that's what I was saying. And, and going back to the, to the fact that it's uh, you know, commercial is what I said. Um, you could rent it out, obviously. So you, you know, you, you bought a small strip mall or something, which you can buy them for. You know, you get three or four units in there, yeah. uh, and you've got a, a monthly income, and it will cover all your expenses, and and the property will go up in value. Yeah. Generally, uh, I say commercial real estate for renting out, not residential. There are people out there. They buy properties and they get an income on a residential. The downside of it is when you've got a tenant in on the, on the residential and if it goes bad on you, they don't make the payment or the rent payment, et cetera, et cetera, or they don't look after your property. Trying to evict is very hard. On commercial, it's very easy. We should do a further episode another time talking about that but yes i i would actually agree commercial real estate is uh, a very good way to invest money provides you with cash flow and it gives you long-term appreciation generally on the property so um so for our audience watching do you have three tips or two tips or five tips on how somebody could become their own version of successful whatever that means whether it's financial physical mental whatever it is well if you you know if we're looking at uh, somebody being successful to whatever degree um, you know through you know business or employment I, I would say stick with what you know stick with what you know um, you know people uh, have been into me over the years and said I'd like to get a, a job as a, a car salesman. I'm passionate about cars, but they don't know anything about them. So I would say stick with what you know because you will be more successful with that. Second thing, don't spend what you don't have. Those are two good tips. And like that 
you know, I'll touch on the first thing, like with me, like I've grown up in the auto industry. So this is the industry I know the best. And, uh, it's obviously the industry that, you know, I have a proven record of being able to generate income and generate money for the business. And every day I go through my mind, okay, how else can I make money? How else can I make money? And I come up with little things here and there, but on the scale of things, you know, they're so small compared to the income that I can generate in this business. So it is a case of like, you know, by me sticking to what I know and mastering that, I become better and better and I'm able to generate more income relative to going out and, you know, trying to start a fishing business, just as a, a weird example. I don't know anything about fishing. I probably wouldn't do great at it. I wouldn't make any money, right? Um, and then, yeah, like said, like you said, uh, not spending what you don't have, which is in today's society, like such a problem. People just either blow money they don't have or blow every penny that they do have and yeah nothing to show for it at the end of the day right so that that is a good tip so um outside of this business is there any other ventures that you're into whether it's personal ventures uh business ventures anything like that the answer to that is because of running businesses and I'm talking about automobile businesses, and uh, and as you know, you know, we have been only involved in car business or medicine. Uh, when I say medicine, I'm not talking about physical medicine. Uh, uh, you know, my wife is a physician, therefore we've run clinics, and I've been the administrator of those clinics over the years. The one thing that is common between the two of them, which have been fairly successful over the years, is that we purchase property for self-use. And both the clinic and clinics uh, over the years, uh, and this dealership uh, were purchased. Um, so we, we're property owners Obviously, after 18 years in here, we own the property. That is, so do we do things? Uh, now we're looking at what can be generated out of, you know, income, uh, rental income on those commercial properties. This one here is, we're still running a business, so this is a little bit different. Um, the clinic we have now rented out to another physician. So we've got income coming in it, but the property is paid for. Uh, so yes, we are involved in other businesses, but we have always stuck to what we know. Yep. And uh, alongside that is owning the real estate. If we had rented this out 18 years ago, the landlord would be a lot better <laughs> off than me. Yes. Um, you know, for amusement, I, if you want me to go to uh, the YouTube channel, which uh, the, this podcast probably will end up on uh, uh, on a YouTube, as you know. Um, but uh, my wife uh, um, is from entertainment. We do a lot of travel. So we have created our own YouTube channel. And um, it's a slow process getting subscribers, let me tell you. Yes. But we do it for entertainment. And we know that the auto industry, for example, gets a lot of looks on your on IM cars, uh, and we're seeing that we're uh, getting a lot of people looking uh, at um, the YouTube channel that um, my wife takes control of. I'm in most of the videos, but only as a prop, um, and you only usually see my hands. So it's kind of a unique flavor, and it's called Wondering Canucks. Not wondering, wondering. That's W-U-N-D-E-R-I-N-G. Um, Canucks, C-A-N-U-C-K-S. So the wondering Canucks travel, uh, and she she ends everyone by, if you can't travel, then travel with us. And of course, we've been doing this now for about a year, so a lot of people have had their wings clipped uh, with the travel. Uh, so it, it was kind of a fitting end to each one of our uh, 
videos and I think we've got about 140 online right now oh. and um, some of them are not great but some of them are very interesting yes that's how it goes though it's a slow build up like you said so we're gonna try to get Wondering Canucks to a thousand subscribers so we can get that YouTube money coming in for you yeah, we're not really looking at this as an income. <laughs> uh, we, we're not looking at it as income at all. It's the challenge. Um, you know, um, we, we got to 100 subscribers and we got a thank you letter, uh, email from YouTube, yep. um, which I, we found that rather interesting. So they want the content uh, and we're doing it for entertainment purely. And, um, and actually, my, my wife is pretty good at it. Uh, do you have any other final statements on the first I Am Cars podcast? Well, I, no, I haven't put any more statements. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Uh, I, I, you know, I think you've, you've done a wonderful job on the, uh, the I Am Cars YouTube channel. Um, I find it very entertaining. Even the ones that I'm in, I find rather entertaining. Those are your favorite, I think, <laughs> the ones you're in. Um, so, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's, and it's a great business, but it's not for the faint of heart. Make sure you've got some cash. And, you know, and make it as honest as you can be in this industry. People, that's what people want. Um, I've got customers that have been buying cars from me for over 20 years. And um, it's, it's a good business. Yeah. Uh, all right. So thank you to our first I Am Cars podcast guest. And uh, be sure to check out the Wandering Canucks on YouTube. And, uh, yeah, let me know what you guys think of the podcast style. We're going to do a couple of these, see how they do. We're going to have some different guests on, which we've got lined up. And if you're interested in being a guest, you can send me an email through the YouTube channel. Let me know you're interested in uh, being on here. And uh, that's it. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, and we'll see you guys on the next one. <laughs>